All right, uh, story time. So I've got two anecdotes to sort of set this up. So the first was, I don't know how many of you, you know, read Zeek log files as text files, uh, how many of you integrate into a sim, uh, but at Correlate we've had to integrate with a lot of sims. And one thing that kept happening, you know, some sims, you just spew JSON at them and they figure out what to do with it and everybody's happy. Uh, others say, cool, can you tell me what all of your various logs are and all of their fields and all of their types and what they all mean? And we sort of scratched our heads and said, well, no. Uh, you know, go to zeek.org and read about them. Uh, and even that like, isn't really correct because it depends on what packages you have loaded. Uh, and so what I ended up doing is saying, well, I can get you at least the, the base set and I would edit the, the RST files that make up the Zeek docs and use Emacs macros to reformat them into a digestible format and then send them off uh, to the partners. And so this is uh, necessarily not a super great way to do it. So I wanted to improve that. And then years ago, I had a user you know, ask me, uh, so where's the docs for all the fields in you know, our running Zeek environment? And I'm like, mm-hmm. That's you know, mostly the ones that are on zeek.org. Yeah, yeah, but where are all of them? Don't have them. About six months later, I get asked again by the same person, hey, so do we have all the logs documented now? And it's like, no, no. Uh, why, don't, why don't you go figure out how to do that? Stalling tactic from uh, grad school. Uh, anyway, uh, so six months later, so how about a <laughs> way to get all the logs? I said, all right, all right, I will go look. And so I tried to take uh, ZekiGen to figure out how to do this. And I failed. Uh, there may have been a way to do it, but uh, I didn't get it to work. So uh, that didn't work. And so I started trying to think about what else I could do. And um, delayed and you know, tried again with ZekiGen, still didn't work. Uh, and said, well, finally, a, I sort of had the puzzle piece come together that within Zeek, there's this metadata. And this metadata is the stuff that I need. So uh, just a, a quick aside, for any non-developers, there's a bunch of stuff that uh, you don't really need to follow. Uh, there's probably only one slide that'll be like complete gobbledygook, but <laughs> mostly you should be able to follow it. Um, so this is a, just a sample Zeek script. Um, there are a bunch of these. There's pretty much one for every log uh, that gets created uh, within the, the Zeek uh, tree, source tree. Um, and there's some stuff to, to highlight, right? So within, within the module, it tells you what protocol it's for. And there's a convention of having an info record that lists all of the various fields. And in general, these are the fields that get logged, especially when you see something like ampersand log. And there's also a convention that before them, you have these uh, comments that explain what they are. So if you're looking to find the fields and the types and what they're for, the information is all right here, right? So what can we do with that? Well, what Zeek already did with that, with ZekiGen, was create a, the docs, right? So it, it just as part of building, it can create the docs. It's very cool. I'm sure it eases the maintenance for everybody, right? You don't get the, the terrible state where your docs are out of sync with the code base. Um, and it had uh, stuff to uh, pretty print them. It uses a, a project called, well, a project called Sphinx that uses RST files. Uh, to do this, and this was all pre-existing. And also, uh, this is deeply integrated with Zeek, and some of this information goes into Zeek itself. And so what that led to was an idea to see what we could do with those hooks. Right? What else could we do? And I was talking with Seth Hall, and he said, well, really what you want to do is you don't really want to create logs or create this thing you hand to, to partners for sims you want to create a JSON schema. And so a JSON schema looks something like this. This is an old example, but uh, it goes through and creates a, a JSON file that documents each log and all the fields and the types and what they're for. 
And he's like, you can do that, and then you can create, or then you can use an open source tool to take that and create your RST files, and then your RST files go through Sphinx, and you've got your docs, and everything will be great. Problem is the RST files from the public, the open tools suck. I mean, sorry if anybody is watching it who created this tool, uh, but, but it creates really uh, bad looking RST files. Uh, it would not be something that we really wanted to publish. Uh, so that didn't work. And so uh, I decided that I'd have to fix it myself. And so what do I do? It's Zeek, so everything's a log. So I create a new log that's a schema log. Uh, and so I write some, a Zeek module called schema here uh, and create a field. So the name is just the name of the log and the schema is the schema for that log. And uh, basically generate one really long text string that is the uh, documentation. And so you get, um, you get the opportunity to pull the metadata and put them put it into a new log. So it's really some metadata about the metadata about Zeek logs, which Vern pointed out on our way here, is metadata about traffic. And so this comment about it is meta, 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 metadata. Okay, so what do the docs look like? Well, you get, oops, oh. Okay, got it. Um, so that, that's the schema, and so that solves you know, Seth's idea of getting the JSON schema. By this point, the JSON schema for me is useful for those partners, um, but the partners weren't actually my main problem. My main problem was the docs. Uh, and so how do I solve the, the docs problem? Well, I say, well, it's the same thing, right? I'm parsing, I'm making the same calls into Zeek, so in the same module, why don't I also create the docs? And so I added new field text and so text is now a big string that's going to describe uh, the docs. And so you get beautiful stuff like this. So uh, as you can see, the problem is solved. All right, well, maybe not. Uh, so there is a little post-processing. So it turns out you, know, you can't put uh, the uh, carriage returns in like you'd want, and you have to quote quotes, and there's some, some stuff that you need to sort of clean up after the fact with Python. Um, but with just a little work, you get a file that looks more like this. And for any of you who've actually looked at, at uh, RST files, this is exactly what they look like. And in fact, you can use this to auto-generate docs that look like this. So uh, success, initial problem solved. Uh, this is pretty much where I stopped for a few months um, <laughs> because uh, I had achieved the two goals uh, from the beginning. And now, in uh, practice, uh, the sim problems were not all solved by having a JSON schema. So uh, it turns out, like going back to Splunk, which I, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, in Splunk you can send stuff in in JSON and it's fine, uh, but you can't send in TSV. And for various reasons, you might want to send in TSV. Instead, uh, to do that, you need to tell Splunk what the data looks like. And you know, everybody who's been paying attention is like, okay, that's exactly the problem you started with. <laughs> so um, why haven't you solved it? And so I thought, you know, thought about it and said, okay, yes, this same solution uh, can be extended to do Splunk. Uh, and so in Splunk, uh, the configuration that tells it how to read a TSV, uh, or not, well, by this point it's a log stream, uh, but the format is tab separated, uh, is, is in two files. They're called props.conf and transforms.conf. And so my idea was I will just apply the same mechanism. And so if you see at the bottom here, I've got a second log now that I'm creating that's called, uh, well, it's called log2 in the enum, and it's called uh, log splunk, I think. <laughs> very creative as the file name. Uh, and it has two, two fields, props and transforms, uh, that I'll throw in the strings uh, to, to create those two files, and a third one called checksum. And so the idea for checksum, I'll talk about it uh, later, but the idea for checksum was simplify operations. So what, what do props and transforms look like? 
So um, props is, and I just continued with the DNS example. Obviously, there are a lot of logs, but they all basically look the same, right? Um, so in props, you have a section for each log, and you say, uh, I actually can't remember why it's called report, but you say I have a report, and what I want you to do is pull it from a transform called DNS fields one, and then in, in the DNS, uh, in, sorry, in the transforms, Dot conf, uh, you create a, a stanza that defines DNS field one. Uh, and then this regular expression in this format tell it what, what to do. So you'd be all set, except for the passage of time. And so people may be asking like, well, why is there a one at the end of that, right? That doesn't make any sense. You could have just called it DNS fields and all would have been simpler. The reason it's called DNS fields one is you may change this log. And if you change this log, you will get a new transforms.com stanza that will unfortunately also be called DNS fields one. Uh, but leaving that aside for a second, you will then have two definitions for how to parse it. And it turns out Splunk is fine with that. You say that your report is DNS fields and it's from DNS fields one or DNS fields two. And so all you actually have to do when you add a new uh, column uh, to DNS fields, or sorry, to the DNS log, is uh, rename it in the output to two and then just have both in your transforms.com. So it gives you a way to update. The, the remaining open question is, how do you know that you need to update? And that's where the checksum comes in. So the idea here was as I create these files, I'll do an MD5 of the strings and store that uh, in each log. And so then on the Splunk side, you say, hey, look at these logs. And whenever the checksum changes, send me an alert so I know to go and update my configuration files. So I've got a backstop to uh, knowing when things have changed. In the ideal world, of course, the person editing the Zeek script just knows that they need to go update Splunk, but you know, we live in a not ideal world, so uh, good to handle that case as well. So I did that, and I, I was good for another few months and thought that everything was fine. Uh, and then I realized we had a, another similar problem, and uh, I have a, a hammer, and so this is another nail. Uh, and uh, this problem was Avro. So for those of you who don't know, any, how many people know what Avro is? A handful. That's actually more than expected. So cool. Um, Avro is an Apache, and by the way, if I get anything wrong, feel free to correct me later. Uh, um, it's an Apache project. It is a, uh, it's, it's, the idea is similar to that JSON schema that I talked about earlier. You want a way to describe data formats. Uh, this was their attempt. It's handy for processing pipelines uh, like Spark, I believe. I haven't actually used it downstream myself, so I'm not super familiar with the tools. Um, but it's doing the exact same thing, right? It needs to document what the data looks like. Now, if you talk to the Brim people, uh, they will tell you all of the problems in Avro and, and why uh, the Z project is better. Uh, but my practical case was I needed Avro. And so what does it look like? It looks something like this. So it's another JSON blob. It's just got different structure to it. So you have sort of a, a preamble. And then it goes through all the fields. And for each field, it defines the name and the type. Okay, So it's really the exact same problem as the JSON was. And so you do it the same way. So at this point, uh, oh, sorry, I skipped a thing. Uh, but there's one, one issue with Zeek. Uh, so Avro is, is fine for really solid formats. I know exactly what is going on. In Zeek, uh, by default, if you don't have a log, it just skips that entry in the JSON output. And that would cause Avro to freak out, right? So your processing pipeline would fail and it would say, hey, this log doesn't match the schema. And I imagine it just drops all the data. And with Zeek, that would happen all the time. So that's no good. And so instead of just doing sort of the natural, here is a thing and here is its value, um, we make everything into a union. So um, every single field can be null or it can be what you'd expect it to be. So a que the query in DNS, for example, uh, you're gonna expect it to be a string. 
99% of the time, I think in Zeek logs, you do have the query and it's there and it's a string. Sometimes we only see the response and so you don't have a query and the, the query would normally be omitted and so this means that if it's not, not there, everything downstream should be happy. So generate stuff that looks like this. And how are we actually doing all this? So this is the one you know, developer warning uh, slide. So if, if you, uh, you're a non-developer, you can zone out for a minute. Um, the idea is you have a high level uh, procedure that loops through all the logs and there's obviously just you know, some stuff to set up the log files and to define terms and some variables and things like that. And it iterates, sort them so that you can do some, deal with ordering problems. And then fundamentally it loops through all the various logs and then with each log it has another preamble opportunity where it can say put something uh, like that Avro header and then it loops through all the fields. And so uh, with that you've got a function called describe that takes a whole lot of arguments because of all that setup. Um, but the key one is format field um, because the way you're gonna treat every single entry is different, right? So for Splunk, we want to do one thing. For JSON, we want to do a different thing. For Avro, we want a different thing. For the docs, we want a different thing. So we create uh, different functions for each of those, and we pass in the function so that it calls the right one uh, for each. So the simplest one of these is the Splunk one. It's two lines, so it fit on the slide well. Uh, <laughs> so you can see all it does is just does a little string manipulation. You know, do we have uh, an outer field and format it properly and then return the string that is what we want to output. So this is, if you recall, this is the output you saw a few slides ago uh, for transforms. So all we have to do for Avro is write similar thing. So uh, I wrote um, on the plane on the way here a format field Avro and it almost works. Uh, it has uh, one known bug, no, two known bugs and uh, I don't know, some number of unknown bugs. <laughs> so. Uh, hopefully it'll be done uh, by next week or in, during next week. Uh, so again, back to my hammer. Uh, Richard here uh, posed me a problem that he has uh, with Elastic Common Schema. So for ECS, you have to do the same thing. You have to know what all the logs are and where all the fields are. And you adjust the transforms so I don't actually know anything about this. It's some sort of scripts or log stash definitions or something that create the pipelines that cause all this magic to happen. But he said, all he really needs to know is what the changes are, okay? So, uh, you know, g given that it was gonna be impossible to like generate all the scripts for him, uh, just figure out what the diffs are and call attention to the right place. And so the idea here is, okay, well, I've already got something that understands all the fields. So all I need to do is figure out how to tell it about versions. So I've got an old one and a new one. And this is an unsolved problem, by the way. Uh, but my idea now is that we're gonna wrap the schema module with another module that will store them and uh, we'll look at the changes. And I'm like, well, we can just do this with the JSON schema, right? So I don't have to write any more code. Uh, it's really what JSON schema should be for. And I can use an open source uh, JSON diff tool and I won't have to write any more code. Once again, the tools suck. Uh, so I did find one. So a lot of them are just web-based and that's you know, really a pain to put into your pipeline. Uh, so uh, I did find one you can install on a Mac or Linux. It will fall down if you change the ordering too much. And even when it all works, it will just say like foobar has been added, right? It will not say, you know, within DNS, you've added foobar. So it helps you, you know, one inch <laughs> um, towards this. Um, so we probably want to do something that will either improve that uh, open source tool to be able to give you a tree uh, down to the part that's changed or do it in Zeek again and have it uh, do something smarter. Um, but then I thought, oh, actually, if we go and do all this work, we can do something else, which is for the RST logs, we can now automatically create a change log that between this previous version and this new one, here are the changes in the field. So there's another potential use for it and uses all of the already existing formatting functions. Um, so it should be pretty straightforward to do. 
Now, there were a few challenges along the way and a few open questions, so I've got other, other sort of nails out in the distance to look at hammering into something. Um, the challenge uh, was Sphinx tables. So one thing that broke that I glossed over earlier when I created uh, these automatic documents was that one single uh, module definition had one field that used a Sphinx table that I could not embed into my, gener my preferred format to output in. And I'm like, oh my goodness, there's just one. So I put in a pull request, you know, hey, can I just change the way this table, this, this comment works? Surely this isn't a big deal. <clears throat> and Christian and Robin and Johanna all said, no, <laughs> can't you think of some other way to do this? <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and in fact, Johanna had added another one in 5.0, so it was no longer just one, it was two, and you know, my, my shortcut was denied. Um, so I wrote a Zeek function, or I, I wrote an if statement to check if it looks like it's a, a, a Sphinx table, and then call a function with the big string that will parse definition, table, definition lists in Sphinx and then create a different form so at least my docs can generate an embedded form uh, that will, will work nicely. So that problem is solved. If anybody goes and adds a general Sphinx table, however, that's not a definition list, that will break. Um, but at least the text will be there and your output it will just look like crap. So <laughs> that's solved. Um, another problem is enums, or not problem, opportunity. Like enums come out as strings, uh, which is, is fine. It's you know, technically correct, but if you have something down, so you're throwing away information, right? So in Zeek, this is a limited set of strings. It'd be nice if you could send that information down. The hooks into uh, Zeek about metadata don't, as far as I could tell, let you, you know, take a type of an enum and get the list of strings back out, so there's no way to do this. Uh, seems doable, uh, so I may have a pull request that actually adds uh, to Zeek at some point rather than pull requests that cheat. Uh, um, Zeek tags are another thing that's not handled. Uh, and then there's, there's no way to tell where these things come from. So you'll get a log that says foobar is in the DNS log, but you don't have anything that tells you foobar comes from package bamzam, right? So, if it's not a sort of base Zeek log, you, you know it's from something that you load, but you don't actually know where to go to get more information beyond that single uh, sentence. So uh, it's another thing that we could add. Um, and there's a question I don't have any idea how to solve, which is while the, the Zeek released modules all totally follow this and are all nice and clean, not all the packages actually follow the conventions, in fact. Mine initially didn't follow the convention properly, so I'm not surprised. And so what do you do when you don't have this metadata? Uh, it's not a problem for types, but it can be a problem for the, the uh, strings, the uh, definitions. Uh, and then finally, there's uh, a missing thing. So packages will have at the very top uh, information about like what the package does that does get into Zeek, and once again, there's no hook to actually get it uh, into Zeek scripts, so that would be another missing. Oh, sorry, actually, there is a hook, but again, the information is lost that you need. So if you knew what file it came from, you could get it, but nothing will tell you what file this particular record field came from, right? So you don't have a way to connect the dots. So another opportunity uh, to change uh, Zeek. So with that, does anybody have any more nails or any other questions about hammers? And no mics. Oh, the mics are all up here. <laughs> questions? I'm running. I'm running. Why don't I wear flat shoes? Uh, in your work with the Elastic ECS schema and the Splunk schemas, did you have a preference or did you find anything one better than the other? So on, uh, in this context, uh, I'll have to point out that the ECS stuff hasn't been done and the Splunk stuff has. So I definitely found Splunk easier. Um, <laughs> uh, 
uh, I do think the ECS work is, is doable. To the broader question of the quality of the schemas, I have absolutely no idea, actually. Um, I have uh, much more Splunk experience uh, with, with ES and looking at it compared to ECS, but other, I personally think that like the common information model kind of approach is fundamentally broken and a bad idea, but maybe it provides enough value for people. Like, you can't solve the general problem of defining information, right? It's ontology, it's philosophy, it's not gonna be solved. If you can do enough to save you some time for, you know, operations in a SOC, okay, good. Uh, but if they're all gonna run into problems. Like, the, the general question can't be solved, so. Other questions? Do we have anything on the Slack channels, guys? Uh, uh, Overn has a question. Right. Steady yourself. <laughs> so uh, Zeke provides some forms of reflection. Do you, reflecting on reflection, um, do you <laughs> think about, it would be great if it had this sort of notion that allowed you to do, I don't know, walk trees easily or dig out, as you mentioned, location information. Have you thought about that or are you just trying to work with what's there? Well, I'm certainly trying to work with what's there. The, as as uh, should have been apparent, these all came from real world problems. This was not a, a theoretical exercise or just curiosity. Um, I think it, you know, if we had more general reflection framework, then more of the hooks would have been there. They probably would have been easier to use. Certainly uh, that then, you know, can lead to doing more changes on the fly, which is definitely an unsolved problem. I know there was a recent discussion of, you know, should we let people add log fields after initial start? This will totally miss those. It runs at in Zekinit, um, and so if we now allow that, I don't know what you do, like in this context, you know, to create a schema. Um, maybe just log something that's a, uh, hey guys, that previous one was wrong and here's a new one. Uh, and then, you know, like maybe take that Splunk mechanism with checksums and do it more broadly so that all the other stuff as it changes uh, could be known to be updated, something like that. Thanks. Others, anything on Slack? Maybe another potential nail, but uh, the open cybersecurity schema framework uh, is recently announced at Black Hat, I believe, Splunk, AWS, quite a few other organizations are behind that and moving that direction. So hopefully this gets easier in the yeah. future. Yeah, I did actually look at that. I probably still have two or three tabs open out of my 150 open tabs because uh, I never drew any conclusions about it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's a great idea. Ah. So then philosophically on that subject, um, where is the foundation? Is the foundation perhaps at the people generating the data or is it the, at the foundation of the framework? So is there, do you have a philosophical thought on which side, which should go first? You know, I took a lot of, I, minored in philosophy at MIT, and uh, I decided I preferred to be very practical. <laughs> so for, for me, it's, it's all about what you can actually do with this. 